이 특별 강연은요 학계와 지성사를 선도하는 세계적인 석학을 초대해 가지고 어, 인류사회의 더큰 미래 그 어떻게 되어야 될 것인지 또 이러한 전망들에 대해서 함께 나누어 보는 그런 성찰과 어떤 통찰들을 서로 나누어 보는 그런 자리입니다 어, 그러면 큰 박수로 어, 슬라브 지제 교수님을 모시도록 하겠습니다 I hope all the technique works, you, that you hear me, and to begin, I really would like to emphasize how proud I am to be here. Why? Because I was told that my books are relatively successful here, which gives me a hope. A hope in what sense? You know? I never really trusted this multiculturalist ideology of how we never can fully communicate, how do you know what I mean, how do I know what you mean, and so on and so on. I always think that uh, universality is possible. Not a kind of a high spiritual universality, but a universality of struggle. We cannot understand each other because in spite of our struggles we share the same spiritual substance but because we participate in the same struggles for emancipation, freedom and so on and so on. The universality is the universality of struggle. Then I would like to say my thanks to of course, first, all of you who were kind enough to come here, but especially to the organizers and to the kind words of introduction. And I cannot resist the temptation to use this kind introduction for the first theoretical clarification. Namely, what was my situation during the introduction? I knew something is spoken there about me. I recognized my name, the name of my country and some more, but you know, so I knew it's about me. I knew as it were that my fate is written there. But it wasn't clear at all to me what this is. This is a little bit like, you know, when somebody describes you and you don't know how are you described so you cannot identify with it like like my god am i really all that and in psychoanalytic theory developed by jacques lacan one of my great teachers this gap the distance that separates my stupid empirical person from my symbolic identity is called symbolic castration. So this is for me the true hospitality that you allowed me to experience again my castration. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, no, in it seriously, you know, castration is precisely this gap that you experience, and this is the basic of all our paradox in speaking beings, between your immediate identity and your symbolic identity. Just think about traditional authority, like a father. A father, for most of us, is a person, is a confused, impotent, whatever. But nonetheless, it's a father. So in his symbolic identity, you respect him. These are the facts of our life. Okay. Uh, uh, the third point, I want to emphasize how deeply affected I am by Korean culture. I follow it quite closely, although we not uh, you expect. 
like I like Korean films, but not so much those big spiritual films like the one Spring, Summer or whatever, you know, it's, it's too spiritual for me. I like, I remember one out a North Korean spy who comes here, meets a girl who is also North spy and then they try to defect or a film called Warriors, a big spectacle about Korea. These are the films that I like. Not too much art. Not good. Okay. I'm okay. So in order to stop losing time, let me please begin. Let me begin with a joke that I consider a very nice one from a classical Hollywood comedy from late 1930s with Greta Garbo playing the main role, Ninoch, directed by the German emigrant Ernst Lubitsch. It's just a short scene. The hero visits a cafeteria and orders coffee without cream. He said, just coffee, without cream. The waiter replies, sorry, but we have run out of cream. We only have milk, so I cannot give you coffee without cream. Can I give you coffee without milk? Because we only have, uh, we only have milk. What's so nice in this idea is that what you don't have, negativity, is part of your identity. It's the basic message of or thesis of dialectics. What you are not. What is missing is part of your identity, which means that although in its immediate materiality coffee without milk is the same as coffee without cream, it's just coffee, but it's not really the same. It matters as to its meaning, coffee without what it is. <coughs> now we can even develop further this paradox, quoting another film where you can see also immediately the erotic dimension of this playing with absence. And you can see in what sense properly human eroticism is part of language. We are really sexual in human sense only because we speak. Uh, it's a British film from, I think, late 1990s, a working class comedy drama, brushed off about miners losing their job and so on. There is a wonderful, again, short scene in that film where a young girl flirts with her future boyfriend and after having dinner together, he accompanies her to her home and there she tells him, again, it's about coffee, uh, why don't you come up to my flat for a coffee? He answers, oh, I would like to, but there is only one problem, I don't drink coffee. And she answers, no problem, I don't have any coffee. You see how nothing happens, but through this double negation, I don't drink coffee, no problem, I don't have coffee. Can you imagine a more direct erotic invitation? I mean, it means directly asserting what we already suspected, that coffee was a pretext for some other things. Now, why lose time with such jokes? And now I'm very serious. Because I think that Today, the way ideology works today, and at the end, if I will have time, I will go more in detail with regard to this. The way ideology works today is not as a direct lie, in the sense of it's directly telling something that it's not true or whatsoever. Ideology is more lying in the sense of implicit implications. It lies not in what it says, but it lies so that it says what it says by generating in us one 
implicit meaning while it's really generating or relying on the opposite meaning. Or to use again the example of coffee, uh, it is giving it is it is giving us coffee without milk, but it claims that it's giving us coffee without cream and so on. So again, what you really have to be attentive to today are these implicit meanings. What is said without being said. For example, in Europe, much more than in your country, we have today hard problems with economic crisis, austerity. And when those in power want to impose on people austerity measures, lower salaries, no health care, and so on, of course, they pretend they are offering, let's say, coffee without milk. You just have to suffer a little bit for your own good, and so on, and so on. They are really offering coffee without cream. So, again, to fight this type of ideology, you have to look at, you have to look at its implications. Why, again, is this so important? Now, I come to my first point. What in Hegelian dialectical tradition we call totality is precisely such a totality, a totality of what there is and of what there is not, of what it is only absent, excluded, and so on. And in a true dialectical analysis, the point is not to include particular events into a larger harmonious totality. Dialectics is not holistic. The point is not don't look at phenomena as they are isolated, look at them holistically. That's not enough. What you should do is to include into a certain concept also all its negations, falsifications, failures, and so on, and so on. For example, let's take today's capitalism. To observe today's capitalism as a totality, it's not enough to say, as a system, it is good, ideally, like Fukuyama described it. It is liberal democracy with successful market economy, and so on, and so on. No, we should look at all those points where capitalism fails within a country or outside a country. For example, people celebrate today Apple, the company, as a model of postmodern, digital, technologically most advanced, successful capitalism. But the first thing to say here is no Apple without Foxconn. Foxconn is the other side. You know what they are doing in their factories in China, even in an openly obscene way. Like, I was shocked when I read a couple of months ago that the boss, top manager of Foxconn, visited the zoo in Taipei and said, I have a big problem. There is one million animals, he meant his workers, that I have to direct, regulate, so I went to the zoo to how to deal with workers and how to deal with thousands of animals at the same time and so on and so on. Or let's take another example, Congo. If you look at the state today, which is horror embodied, it's the Republic of Congo. It's simply a state which is immensely rich, wealthy, minerals and so on, but a state which doesn't function, doesn't exist as an operative state. You have simply local warriors, warlords, who control parts of it and directly deal with foreign companies, because the minerals for Congo are crucial. They are in all your computers, iPads, uh, notebooks, and so on. So it is wrong to say, unfortunately, Congo is not yet 
developed enough to be part of global capitalism. No, precisely as such as the horror of this land without rule of law. For example, there are in Congo, people think at least one or two thousand, sorry, hundred or two hundred thousand child uh, warriors. You know, children, you start to give them hard drugs when they are seven, eight, and at eleven, twelve, you have perfect killers without conscience. As such as this, hell on earth, Congo is part of today's global capitalism. Global capitalism needs it. Global capitalism are not just successful countries like more and more. You, up to a point China, Singapore or Northern Europe or whatever. Global capitalism is all this, also the dark side, which has to be excluded. For example, your own country among others. Okay, you are doing nice, but what about, I don't know if this came true if it was realized. But I know a couple of years ago, some of one of your big companies had plans basically to buy all the best land, arable land in Madagascar. And it's not just you. Many developed countries today are simply buying the best land in especially African countries and uh, throwing out local farmers and so on and so on and so on causing new hunger and so on and so on. This is global capitalism. Again, uh, uh, you know where a proper dialectical analysis begins? When you have a certain ideal universal notion, capitalism, communism, whatsoever, then look at the failures or non-intended byproducts of this notion and the basic gesture of dialectics is to see how these failures are necessary failures. How it's not just a misfortune. It's not that, oh, because there were bad capitalists there in Congo and so on and so on. No. All these mistakes, antagonism, horrible byproducts are part of the, precisely part of the universal uh, notion. I think. The, the, the category which is more and more becoming crucial today along these lines is the category of unemployment. In the standard Marxist tradition, capitalism was defined by exploitation. But I think that today those who are not even in a position to be properly exploited, those who are unemployed, are becoming more and more crucial. It's not only the reserve army, those who are temporarily unemployed will be maybe employed later. It's more and more first, people who with new technological development are unemployable, forever unemployed, if they don't find job in a totally different uh, sphere. Then we have even whole countries, Somalia, Congo up to a point and many others, or at least whole regions in countries which are, as it were, in some sense unemployed, excluded from world traffic, from world market. Uh, then you have people who are already in advance unemployable. This is, I think, one of the main causes of great unrest in Europe. You have thousands millions of students who study, but they, all of a sudden, they become aware that there is no chance for them that they will forever get a job in the domain of their studies. So I think that, that uh, we have somehow to expand the domain of, let's call them, proletarians, the exploited. It's not only those who work and are exploited. We should include also those who are not even able to work, because this exclusion is precisely part of how capitalism is functioning. It is more and more generating necessary unemployment. 
Why? Now let me go a step further. Why don't we see this more clearly, although it's pretty obvious? I think that this shows the strength of the ruling hegemonic ideology. You know where you can see its strength? Precisely in the omnipresence of anti-capitalism. What do you mean by this? It's very easy today to be anti-capitalist. Just look at any popular media. You have all the time reports on how this company is exploiting children, that company is polluting the environment, that bank is speculating, and so on and so on. But all this critique of capitalism remains a moralistic critique. They accuse, I don't know, greedy bankers, greedy capitalists, and so on and so on. Uh, and I think we shouldn't just blame people here. I am tired of these stories how, oh, that capitalist is an evil guy, greedy. Well, bankers were always like this. The problem is what changed in recent capitalism that this greed can be realized with such catastrophic consequences. That is to say, the limit of this, let's call it moralistic anti-capitalism, is that it, by blaming people and their bad character, their greed, their corruption, and so on, it prevents us from doing the crucial analysis, which is the analysis, which is the analysis of the system. What is wrong with the uh, system as such. This is, for me, the only big question today. Everyone today is, uh, almost everyone, is a Fukuyamaist. I'm referring to Francis Fukuyama. Even most of the critics of capitalism are. Because large majority today accepts as a matter of fact that liberal, democratic capitalism is the only game in town, as the Americans put it. The only system that really works, and all we can do is to make it a little bit better, more efficient. When I was young, we were all, some people, fighting for socialism with the human face. Today it is as if the limit of our horizon is capitalism, global capitalism with the human face. More rights for minorities, more solidarity, and so on, but we accept the system as such. It is as if effectively seeing the limit of capitalist system is almost unimaginable, if I may put it like this. It's... Uh, like my good friend, American Marxist Frederick Jameson, he noticed this, namely how uh, in today's science fiction even, we can easily imagine the end of the earth, an asteroid hitting the earth, end of life, whatever. Easy to imagine, but a, a little bit of a social change that would limit capitalism, we cannot imagine that. The end of the world, okay, but capitalism uh, uh, has to stay. Now, I am not blaming here some evil ideologists and so on and so on. It's a much more complex situation. Uh, uh, I read recently, it's a wonderful detail of ideological struggles, not recently, a year ago, I think, a little bit less, in the fall of 2011, I read that in... People's Republic of China, they, I don't know who this day is, some Ministry for Information of Culture, they prohibited the topic of time travel and alternate history in all narrative media, uh, narrative films, TV series, novels, and so on. Why? Okay, it's obvious. They were afraid that people will start to think about alternatives. But I think this is a good sign for China. At least those in power are afraid that people will imagine alternatives. In our more democratic countries, 
nobody even dares to imagine even dares to imagine this type of different different new world why am i emphasizing this because your obvious counter argument would have been pro probably so what's the problem we know that communism miserably failed and i agree with this 20th century communism was overall a catastrophe it failed so why not simply stay with what we have well i will not uh, repeat the analysis from my books which already translated here just briefly i would say and this is for me the crucial problem i would say that there are enough signs that we are approaching problems from ecology to biogenetics uh, 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 and so on and so on even to the problem of so-called intellectual property which i think that in the long term global capitalism together with its political expression liberal democracy will not be able to confront properly here i am a moderate pessimist i think when people accuse us radical leftists for utopia i claim no the true utopia is to think that things can simply go on the way they are now i'm not saying there will be a catastrophe tomorrow and so on i'm just saying that we are approaching a certain limit for example we know that the environment cannot sustain rapid development in countries like china and so on simply the world uh, the world environment cannot sustain this and we also know i think that local ways to resist this are not enough we try to escape it to avoid this confrontation and here i would like to improvise with you some wonderful way ideology ways ideology penetrates our daily lives maybe you know some of them i always found them amusing for example i claim that most of our charitable activities or most of our care for organic food and so on that they are pure ideology you know for example now i will be very cynical imagine yourself you go to a store i don't know how popular here in your country this is but in all western europe and united states the big trend among, among snobbish upper middle class people or intellectuals is for example to buy organic food i will be very cynical i claim that okay imagine yourself in a store you see an organic apple it's usually rotten much uglier than the good biogenetically modified apple and it costs more but you buy that one why i don't think you really believe that it really does something to environment or whatever i think you basically do it because it makes you feel good that is to say you feel a little bit guilty oh my god it's not good what we are doing to environment and then you are looking for a cheap way out and you tell say yourself isn't this nice i bought this apple i'm doing something for the mother earth i'm part of a big movement of millions of people who are with me together to help the mother earth it's this sublime feeling which is again ideology at its purest let's go on with charity i think it's the same you know you for example i don't know you buy coffee you buy uh, for example you buy uh, uh, you buy uh, coffee or uh, uh, sorry for example when you it's very popular in the west you contribute some money it can be even pseudo personalized you establish contact through some agency with an african orphan and you send i don't know 
20 dollars even less every month and once a year you get a letter back with a photo and so on and so on it makes you feel good you are doing something isn't it wonderful I even know the face there and so on and so on I think that uh, it, this is what is offering you t as it were an easy way out like because you don't really have to change your life you as it were it's I think even an example of superstitious thinking don't underestimate this superstitious thinking today its power I saw it today when I came here I descended from my hotel in the elevator and I saw that you are here here you disappointed me a little bit because you displayed the same stupidity as in the United States you at least this hotel but maybe it's because it's more for foreigners Hyatt I don't I hope this is true you don't have the 13th floor it's 12th and 14th now if you are really consciously afraid of the number 13 then you must know that you are doing something stupid because whom are you cheating God knows very well that 14 is really 13 if you skip you know what I mean but nonetheless you play the game this is I think how ideology functions today you don't have to believe in it, but you still act as if you believe I'm sorry if I now will use an example which I used in many of my books but I think it's the perfect example of today's ideology it's the anecdote about Niels Bohr you know the quantum physicist who had a country house outside Copenhagen a friend, scientist visited him there and saw a horseshoe above the entrance I don't know how is it here with you but in Europe a horseshoe above the entrance is a sign of superstition like allegedly it keeps the evil spirits outside okay so the friend asked Niels Bohr but you are a scientist are you crazy why do you have this there do you believe in it and you know what was Niels Bohr's answer a perfect one he said I'm not stupid of course I don't believe in it but I have it there because I was told that it works even if you don't believe in it that's ideology today you don't have to believe in justice in democracy but you do you think that somehow what would it it works even if you don't believe in it I mean in our system maybe in our everyday ideology this type of superstition but maybe superstition is not a good word it's more something like the materiality of belief like you can believe literally without believing I'm sorry if I use another example from my early books which maybe some of you know but I think it's perfect for me at least the greatest contribution of America United States to world culture so-called can't laughter you know the TV set those stupid American series like Cheers friends where the TV laughs for you laughter is included into the soundtrack I think this is a wonderful invention imagine yourself you Koreans I know are hard-working people that's what some scientists claim so imagine you come home at 7 8 tired as a dog you want to relax you open TV you just of course you are tired you just look at it like an idiot tired and the TV even laughs for you and I don't know if it works for you but it works for me after it I feel relieved as if I have laughed it can laugh for you these mechanisms are not just to make us uh, to make just to, to make good jokes this is I think for example how our beliefs function today we don't really believe nobody believes today people pretend to be cynics you know oh I don't care uh, uh, I know life is cruel it's just sex money power whatever 
people don't believe, but you know how you can detect their beliefs. They usually need another one to believe for them. The psychoanalytic term for this would have been subject supposed to believe. And it's again absolutely crucial, this category today. Like most people, at least in my country, they are not patriots. They say, uh, who cares about blah, blah, blah. But nonetheless, they don't like you to make or me to make fun of our own country. And then when you ask them, but why not? They say, oh, listen, but it's my son. He will not understand it. I have to pretend to, you know, it's like, do you have here something that in Europe corresponds, something here that corresponds to what in Europe we call Santa Claus? That stupid guy, you know it. Red dress who brings presents to children. It's a wonderful structure, you know, where you ask parents, do you believe in Santa Claus? They would have said, <laughs> I'm not idiot, of course not. I buy the presents. Okay. Then you ask children. They would say, of course not. I'm not an idiot. I pretend not to disappoint my parents. and to." You know, here you have a nice example of a belief which functions as a social link without anyone really believing. And this subject supposed to believe can also be a totally imagined entity. An old story from my past from communist Yugoslavia. There was a situation at some point it really happened and a sociological research established this. All of a sudden there was a rumor that there is not enough toilet paper in the stores. Now, most of the people knew that this is a false rumor, that with normal consumption of toilet paper, there is more than enough of it. But each of us reasoned like this. I know this is just a rumor. But what if there are some idiots who will take this rumor seriously and will start to buy excessive amounts of toilet paper. So, and then there will be really a shortage of toilet paper. So, to, to prevent this, that I will be out of toilet paper, better to go and buy it now. And when enough people did this, there really was a shortage of toilet paper. But you see the paradox. No one really believed there is a shortage of toilet paper. We just believed that there is another one that there are some others who are stupid enough to believe, as it were. This, again, this is, I think, absolutely crucial for our situation today. That, uh, and I think here, conservatives who claim, you know, we are entering a hedonist era, an era where people uh, think just of, about their pleasures, they no longer believe, are no longer ready to sacrifice their lives and so on. I think they are totally wrong. We believe more than ever, but just in this objectified, alienated way. Of course, we don't believe in the first person, but we believe by way of, as it were, attributing our belief onto another, but again, the belief still maintains its function. And incidentally, here also, European uh, scientists were totally wrong when they uh, met so-called, entered so-called primitive societies, and you know, when that society thought that, when they claimed our totem is, I don't know, a fish or an eagle, a bird. And Europeans thought they really believed that these people are so stupid as to believe that they developed out of a bird. But then I read a good analysis when someone who entered this tribe asked them, but do you really believe that people from your tribe descend from that bird? It's interesting what type of answer they got. It was something like, no, we don't really believe, but we were told that there was, everyone says, but there was, I heard, a grand uncle of mine who believed it, and so on, you know, like, once they believed it, or whatever. I think that the first step 
outside of cultural racism is to admit that nobody believes, that if there is an idiot who believes, it's ourselves, not the others. Let me tell you, before I get lost, then I will return to my main line, another function which is this cultural miscommunication at its purest. Maybe you know it, but it's so wonderful that I like to repeat it. In the middle of 19th century, some, I think it was German, anthropologists visited a tribe in the middle of North Guinea. Guinea. They heard that this tribe knows how to dance some terrib terrible dance of death. Okay, so they visited the tribe, they arrived there in the evening, and they somehow, through their gestures, explained to them that they want to see their famous, terrifying dance of death. They went to sleep, next day they awakened, and members of the tribe effectively performed for them this terrible dance. So satisfied, they wrote their anthropological report about the primitive dance, fascination of primitives with death, and so on, and left the tribe. Unfortunately, 20 years later, another expedition visited the same tribe and asked them what really happened with the first expedition. And since this second group learned properly the language, understood better the local people, they got the true story, which is a wonderful one. Uh, when the tribe was visited by the first expedition, they terribly tried to guess what do these foreigners want from them. And somehow they guessed that they want some stupid, terrible dance of death. So the whole night they worked constructing this mask just out of politeness, politeness and hospitality, and they organized this dance to be, to be nice towards them. So you see what the stupid white people thought, oh, the authentic primitive horror, but just the others being polite and trying to guess there. Here, also, we should be very, very precise and careful about so-called primitive authenticity. I wonder if it was shown in your country a wonderful uh, Eskimo Inuit film, The Fast Runner, which retells an old Eskimo myth about a conflict and in the original myth from 17th century, it's total catastrophe at the end. The two tribes kill each other, everyone is dead. In this new version, it just, they throw out two bad guys and there is a big reconciliation. So then a white journalist asked the authors, why did you commercialize your myth? Why didn't you stick to the original story? Why didn't you remain authentic to your culture? And he got a wonderful answer. The answer is that, no, it's precisely part of our original authentic culture not to repeat the same story, but to change it accordingly to new situations. They said, this is our tradition. It's you, stupid Europeans, who are obsessed with authenticity, you know, the original version and so on and so on. And this is what I always like when I see here, on the way here, on a taxi or everywhere, you know, these uh, stores selling authentic Korean medicine and so on and so on. I think they are intelligent enough to, I was told this in, in uh, New Zealand, they have Maoris, the natives there, who have their representatives in New York, who look at new fashions, what now the market wants, and then he tells this to these local authentic painters, tribal, who quickly change this, their style to fit better the, you know, they reinvent, and I think that, that like, uh, the paradox is that this apparently corrupted attitude, it's much more authentic in its way than sticking to some uh, original, uh, original authenticity or whatever. Okay, let's not get lost. Uh, I just wanted to convince you to this couple of examples of why is this structure of belief, belief to belief and so on, so crucial. If you know even a little bit about capitalism today, 
speculations with futures and so on and so on. You know that it's all sustained by trust and belief or belief in belief. When you play with futures on s the stock market, I you, it's even complicated as to the, to the third level. You don't just invest, you don't just try to guess with your investment what people will believe two years from now. You try to guess what most of the people believe that people will believe it two years from now. And I think there is something almost uh, horrifying in this, uh, let's call it, fragility of the social edifice of today's global capitalism. How much it is based on this, how should I call it, belief or believe in belief. But again, I'm not a psychological idealist here. I'm not saying there is no objective reality, there are just beliefs or whatever. No, the problem is that these beliefs are material beliefs. They are materialized in our acts and so on and so on. Which is why, as I always insist, we should return to Marx, his notion of commodity fetishism, which is precisely a wonderful notion, totally useful today. Why? Because Marx does not claim that we in fetishes, in market fetishism, that we believe something which doesn't fit reality. No. Marx claims that we practice beliefs of which we are not aware. Marx is saying that if you take a typical capitalist, he is totally cynical realist. But when he deals on the market, he practices a belief. His belief is in what he does, not in what he thinks. It's a wonderful dialectical notion of a belief which is a material belief. Belief embodied in your practice, not in what you are doing. Which is why, incidentally, do you know, which I think this explains why a certain type of pseudo-oriental spiritualism, Zen Buddhism or whatever kind of Buddhism, is so popular among top, top bank managers, investors, digital capitalists, and so on and so on. Do you, did you know this? It's very interesting that the most popular spiritual orientation among them is some kind of a vaguely orientalist Buddhist spirituality. Why? Because they are fully aware of this fragility of our social reality. You know, you have a certain economic orientation, successful. People start to believe not even start to believe what is reality. People start to believe that other people believe something and everything can collapse. And, of course, the idea is that this is something close to the ontological fragility, the world is just the game of appearances and so on, uh, 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 which we find, again, in Buddhist teachings. I think this is a nice example of how, of ideological, how should I call it, Transfunctioning, refunctioning, where an old concept can acquire new actuality. You take something like the Buddhist ontology, you know of uh, sunyata, void, nothingness, our reality is just a game of appearances and so on. And you, you can discover how it fits perfectly the most modern, even postmodern global capitalist global capitalist uh, experience. Okay, uh, so back to that idea of uh, uh, superstition and so on. I claim that uh, uh, what is so difficult to admit apropos ecology today, it's not so much that it's difficult to recognize our responsibility, like we are destroying nature and so on. Maybe it's even more difficult to recognize that up to a point it doesn't even depend on us. You know, like the final scene pretty horrifying from that Lars von Trier new movie Melancholia where you just know it's the end of the world 
you can't do anything. And I think that much of this small level ecology, this sty uh, s uh, life sty uh, style of life, mini ecology, you know, this constant superego in the psychoanalytic sense of ethical agency, superego pressure, like, did you throw a can of coke away or did you recycle it? Do you recycle all your newspapers and so on? I think it's 80% this type of superstitious activity. I'm not saying it's not good and important doing it. I'm doing it. I claim it's avoiding the true problem, which is a much larger one. We will not save the earth by, by recycling Coca-Cola cans. We will maybe, maybe save the world by totally changing our mode of production and so on and so on. So what I'm saying is that, are you aware that, are you aware of this strange phenomenon, which is another example of everyday superstition? When you uh, watch at home some sport, soccer, football, basketball, whatever match, even if you are just at home in front of TV with your friends, you shout and cry as if in this way you can help your team there. It's pure everyday magical thinking. Although you rationally know they don't hear you, it's nothing, but you do it. I claim recycling Coca-Cola cans is a little bit similar. It's a little bit similar to this. So you see here again, and yes, okay, I will repeat my old, old example that you all know. Unfortunately, I noticed that even here you have Starbucks. Starbucks are the greatest here for me. You know why? Uh, they... The starting point of Starbucks is that we feel bad as consumers, you know. But, you know, when I don't know if it's true here in Europe and United States, it is that Starbucks make publicity of how conscious they are socially. You know, they say for each cup of cappuccino that you buy with us, two cents go to some Somali starving children, two cents go to save the rainforest, whatever. And this is a wonderful capitalist solution, that they include the price for consumerism like into the price of commodity. Like they tell you, do you feel bad by being a consumerist, spending too much? No problem. Pay a little bit more and you pay a price for, for consumerism, you know. It's, it's so again, uh, what I'm saying is that with all these phenomena of beliefs, magical thinking, and so on and so on, we are not dreaming here to understand today's capitalism, its crisis, the way capitalism works at the level of ideology, and so on and so on. All this is absolutely, all this is, I think so, absolutely crucial. Now, let's go a step further. What happens when this system threatens to collapse. There are signs in the last two, three years that the system is at least becoming aware of its limitations. Like this is what the great movement Occupy Wall Street was about, I think so. About the first awareness of a limitation. Because this was not just a protest movement against war, racism, whatever. It was a movement based on the insight that there is some structural fault, problem with capitalist system as such. But here, if you permit me one last circle, here as leftists, we should be brutally honest. Brutally honest. In what sense? Listen. Now, maybe this will not be popular with some of you if you are traditional leftists, but till like five years ago, at least in the developed West, the left, when capitalism thrived in relative prosperity for most of the people, at least for most in the West, uh, the usual critical Marxist intellectuals attitude was yeah, yeah, this is a false prosperity, just wait for the crisis, you will see things will collapse, and so on and so on. 
they were, as it were, waiting for their great moment. You know, playing this, what we call in Europe, Cassandra from Homer, Iliad, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the one who always predicted the catastrophe. Now the crisis is here. Not with you, you are the lucky ones, you, Brazil, Singapore, whatever, but at least in Western Europe, in United States and so on, there is at least a feeling of gloom, crisis, large demonstrations, Greece and so on. And where is the left? Nowhere. Nowhere in what sense? Even in this time of massive protests and so on and so on, where the left was expected to bring together unify all these movements into one great proposal, like that's what we should do. I think the left failed here. I am not aware of any, and I'm not, of any alternative proposal, what to do. And I'm not talking about detailed plans. Of course, we cannot do this. I'm talking about very general orientation. What do we want? Like, what should we do now? Is this a crisis of capitalism as such? Or is it just a limited crisis of a certain type of capitalism where we need more public spending, uh, health care, whatever, to make it more efficient? If we have to move outside of capitalism, how? Through return to state centralized property, some more dispersed local democracy, or whatever, we get, it's incredible how I am not aware of any, not even minimally realistic proposals. I think that the left, whatever remains of radical left, is still caught into this, uh, uh, into this, uh, let's call it messianic expectation. You know that. We just patiently wait. There will be a moment when the authentic working class, not social democracy, not Stalinist, communist, will finally realize their destiny, come together and do the real revolution, whatever. It, they are all, as it were, wa waiting for the event, with capital, the great event, to happen and patiently waiting. I think we have finally to accept that there will not be such an event. This doesn't mean things will just continue to go on the way they do. No, no, there will be ecological catastrophes, starvation, mass chaos, war, and so on and so on. But what I doubt is that there will be this one great event of massive global redemption, whatever. So. Now, there will be, again, your skeptical attitude in the sense of why not nonetheless accept where we are? Isn't the dream of a radical change an impossible dream? Ah, here again, we should be very careful today, I claim. Did you notice how in our, I hope with you it's the same as in Western Europe, in United States, in Japan, how, when people talk about what is possible and what is impossible, and by people here I mean simply the big media, it's a very strange duality that we get. When you talk about technology and private pleasures, almost nothing is impossible. They are promising God that things that we cannot even imagine today are more and more becoming possible. Like, I don't know, the ultimate dream is this dream of gnostic digital technology that we will turn into software programs and just embody ourselves from one to another, hardware becoming immortal. Or there are these crazy dreams of multiple sexuality, like my bad taste example and it's not a dream. I spoke with a doctor who is doing this today in New York. They, a doctor can split your penis into two. 
so that you can do it to two we with two women at the same time, whatever you want. All this can be possible, or, you know, growing organs through cloning and so on, whatever. Here things are, or, soon we will, as curious, be able to fly to other planets. Again, in private pleasures, in technology, no problem. Things are possible, possible. But isn't this a strange world where immortality may be possible, changing all your organs, blah, blah, may be possible, but to give 2% more money for healthcare, ah, impossible, we lose competitivity, and so on, and so on. Did you notice how this growing possibility of the impossible in the sphere of technology and private life is one side, the other side is as if any, even moderate, social change is immediately dismissed as utopian, impossible, it will cause a catastrophe, it will cause a, uh, it will cause a uh, 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 war or police terror, whatever. Maybe this is the clearest example of ideology today. Ideology is not primarily the big lessons, you know, belief in this and so on. Ideology is precisely this automatic structure of our, as it were, mental space, which makes something possible, other things uh, unthinkable for us. And, uh, and uh, again, this is, for me, the, the problem today. Namely, the reason I don't want to accept this easy solution, which would have been, okay, let's drop it. I mean, let's stay with what we are and just fight moderately and so on and so on, is that I am uh, too much of a pessimist here. I, again, as I already said, I think that the Fukuyama dream is over. I think that we are approaching times where just imagine, for example, a nuclear catastrophe or ecological catastrophe just two, three times stronger than the Fukushima catastrophe. The solution would have been to move tens of millions of people, to change the whole social body and so on and so on. Who will do this? How will, how will it be done? And so on and so on. Just think about biogenetics. I find it fascinating, but are we aware what is going on that already, and it's not some utopian future, at the very elementary level they can do it more and more now. Namely what? Not only through biogenetic and other way to affect our psychological properties, sense of pride and so on. It, what do I mean by this? If you don't believe me, go to Google after this talk and just put into Google DARPA, D-A-R-P-A. It's not a joke, it's a program financed by CIA. It's pretty terrifying. It's explicitly, I'm not now caricaturizing it, the crop program with the goal how to change narrative structures and beliefs through direct uh, brain biogenetic interventions. So the idea is, and that's their example, you have somebody who started to believe in Islam fundamentalism and became a terrorist. Let's observe what happens in his brain when he accepted those beliefs, and let's try to change his beliefs, not by any ideological work, even brainwashing, Brainwashing, you still wash the brain by automatic, repetitive arguing. No, by simply, with chemical means or operations, directly intervening into it. The goal, it's pretty hard. You know what I mean? This changes the whole notion of ideological struggles. It's no longer ideological. It's simply, I reduce your belief, conviction, to a neuronal process in your mind, and I try to affect it directly. Now, now uh, I'm not blaming this. I'm just saying that this is not just 
a crazy idea because probably it was also in your media how, for example, a computer can already read the fundamental orders in your brain so that, for example, if you are totally crippled, you no longer need even what Stephen Hawking needs. You remember, like, moving his finger a little bit. They just uh, uh, attach your brain to computer. You think strongly forward, it goes forward. You think left, it goes left. Now, this sounds nice. You are like God. You can make things move by your thought alone. The problem is that it also goes outside, inside. <laughs> like they can also affect you, and so on, and so on. I mean, now I'm not painting you a dark prospect. I'm just saying something here tremendously important is happening, which will probably affect the very definition of what it means to be human. Because our basic human identity presupposes this limit. I'm here with my thoughts, reality is out there. You can torture me whatever you want, my thought remains free. What if this, this, this border falls down? Who will control this? How? And so on and so on. These are immense challenges, which again, I think cannot be properly confronted, dealt with, in, with today's global capitalism. Because, you know, ideology is not simply a lie. Ideology is, ideology deals with real problems, but in a false way. For example, for me at least, ecology becomes ideology when you translate it into some cheap New Age spiritualism. And you say, oh, because we abandoned Mother Earth, whatever, and you... Pre this is clearly, it, or in a more refined way, I wonder if you will agree this, and with this I will, so that the kind organizers will not, will not, uh, will not, uh, the time, yes, will be to finish slowly. I'm sorry if I'm too long. Just one example again of this, uh, uh, every day of this uh, uh, fun functioning of, of uh, ideology. Take the notion of tolerance. We talk a lot about tolerance today. But did you notice how ambiguous this category is? Tolerance, yes, but... I mean, I'm all for tolerance, when it means tolerate diversity and so on and so on. But tolerance can also meet, mean something quite the opposite. It means, don't come too close to me, I don't tolerate your proximity and so on. You know, uh, this is why, for example, now I will go to the end with an extreme proposition. I will defend, I don't smoke, and I hate tobacco companies. But do you also have this obsession with smoking should be prohibited and so on and so on? I think it's ideology. I'm not saying people are not dying of smoking. But, you know, people are also dying from alcohol, from drugs, and so on. And I notice in the West how the same left liberals who oppose smoking, then they offer you drugs the same evening, and so on. So, why was smoking elevated into this ultimate, as it were, image of horror? You know, like, it's incredible, at least in the West, how far this goes. Even when you buy a cigarette, it started with that inscription, obligatory, smoking may hurt your health. Then it w became more brutal. Smoking kills. Now, the next step was to be even more specific. Smoking will render you impotent and so on. Then, the last fashion in Europe is you have big photos of like your lungs, operation and so on, and uh, this is what you smoke. No, I'm not uh, uh, for smoking. But I think that uh, this example is a good example of how false our hedonism is, I claim. We don't really live in a hedonist society. We live in a society of moderate, regulated pleasures. Uh, uh, 
uh, beer, yes, but beer without alcohol. Coffee, yes, but decaffeinated coffee. You know? Do it properly, do it moderately. Hedonism, for me, real hedonism means I don't care, I go to the end, I smoke, I have sex till I drop dead, which is not a bad idea, but not what is advised today. When I flew here from Europe three days ago, I read the most horrible text I can imagine on that uh, journal of the, you know, in-flight journal of the company. It was a text praising sex, but in the most depressing way you can imagine. The thesis was, sex is good for health. And then they described how if you change position like this, this it's even better than jogging. Then they claimed that even deep kissing is good, because deep kissing strengthens your muscles here, so that when you are old, the saliva will not... I mean, it's absolutely depressing. And to conclude with an example of everyday ideology, did I claim that Excessive sex, or even more, love, love as passionate love, is becoming prohibited. Today's ideology is not monogamy. I don't know how it's here, but in United States and Europe, I can guarantee you, today's ideology is kind of a moderate experimenting. Be who you truly are, make experiments, try it with a woman, with a man, with two women, with a man and a dog, whatever you want. But don't identify yourself so much, too much, you know. And uh, in this sense, let me give you an example, which may surprise you, if you know this bit. Did you see the last James Bond film, Quantum of Solace? Politically, it's even pretty interesting, because it's very leftist. Basically, James Bond saves Morales' regime in Bolivia from a bad international company. But did you notice something strange? It's the first James Bond film where, at the end, there is no sex between Bond and Bond girl. And this is a tendency now. Did you see the most disgusting novels and films? Dan Brown. Did you notice how in Da Vinci Code, you have hero and heroine, Robert Langdon, the symbologist, and his, uh, the grand-granddaughter of Jesus Christ. Okay. There is no sex between two of them. And I claim that the, uh, there has to be sex in heaven. You know, the thesis is that Jesus Christ married Marie Magdalene and so on, to cover up the fact that there is no sex here, as it were, on earth. Even worse, did you see the last Dan Brown film, Angels and Demons? There, there is sex in the novel, but no sex in the film. I think the tendency is clear and a terrifying one. It's that every, as it were, excessive engagement, open to the other, is considered as dangerous. This is why, at least the Western Europe, through these marriage or dating agencies, is, I think, returning to pre-modern practices of arranged marriages. What do I mean by this? What do I mean by this? I don't know your language, how you put it, but in French and in English, when you fall in love, we use the verb fall to designate this, and that's the most beautiful thing about love. No, I see you and then, oh my God, it's my fate, I cannot help, and so on. Do you know that now, I noticed it, and my good friend Alain Badiou noticed it in France, how more and more dating agencies directly refer to this phrase. And, for example, one big publicity that I saw is, we will enable you to be in love without the fall, without falling in love. You know, the idea is, do it safely, in a healthy way, don't risk the encounter, none of that traumatic fall, and so on. And uh, uh, I think, again, that this is something which is, for me, pretty terrifying. This means that sex is more and more becoming no longer this deadly, passionate attachment, which is, I think, even the first form of metaphysics. If metaphysics means that you are in your vulgar daily life, but then you encounter another dimension, something which totally changes, opens another 
that is this passionate sexual love, is not passionate sexual love an example of this metaphysics? It's the catastrophe, in the sense that I live my happy life, happy, maybe a one night stand here, there, short sex, drinks, then I fall in love. My happiness is over. Everything is subordinated to that. It's a traumatic encounter. Which is why, now really to conclude, I think that uh, what is more and more happening is that the structure of sexual encounters is becoming that of, let's call it, masturbation with a real partner. You just want to play games and it's at least till now more satisfying to do it with another person than with some plastic objects or whatever and it's pretty terrifying to what extent our industries already provide more and more plastic objects. For example, I saw recently a publicity among those horrible sexual free ads that you get on your email for something like vaginal trainer for men, sounds horribly. It looks like a lamp. You open the top it's, and it's the entry to vagina, plastic, so the idea, and it's electrically regulated. You can regulate the form so that it looks like, no, you put different plastic top in it. It can be vagina, uh, anus, or mouth. And then you can regulate how thick it is, and so on and so on. And you just do it alone, and so on. So, you know, in my first book, I think, or second, I quoted a publicity from Australia 20 years ago. I think it's now becoming a reality. In Europe we have this well-known fairy tale story of a girl who sees a frog and the girl kisses the frog and the frog turns into a young prince. This is the first part of the publicity because it's the publicity for beer. Girl sees a frog, kisses the frog, the frog turns into a beautiful young man. But you know what then happens? The boy kisses, the prince kisses the girl, and she turns into the bottle of beer, like, this is what I really want. I think we are passing from this woman who still wants uh, at least a human partner to a man who wants just a partial object. And uh, Jacques Lacan, in his psychoanalytic theory, was deeply impressed by this movement of our technology towards this, let's call it whatever, post-sexual sexuality. And I claim that even our obsession with so-called sexual harassment, first I'm aware there is real harassment and I'm totally opposed to it. What I'm only saying is that quite often, when, at least in the United States I notice this, people are obsessed with harassment. But the basic message is that almost ev anything you did is, you know, when you are in the process of seduction, someone has to make the move which, if the other says no, becomes harassment. Harassment is the, what I'm saying is this, the hidden ideal of this attack against harassment, it's pure contractual sex. We make a plan in advance, I agree, you agree this. We just make a plan, a kind of a legal pact about how we will use each other for our pleasures. I think, so, again, I didn't lose my thread here. I'm still talking about today's capitalism. What I'm saying is that all these changes that I was indicating, this, how even intense sexual commitment becomes something dangerous, this preaching of moderation and so on, or <coughs> the structure of beliefs that I described, how, <coughs> sorry, even if we don't believe, we believe to believe and so on and so on. This is not just ideology in the sense of something up there. This is ideology in the very heart of our economic process of consumption, uh, uh, production, exchange, and so on and so on. And 
So again, things are happening today and for me to be still a communist. Okay, I will not lose time now. If you want, you can ask me afterwards why I still prefer to use this horrible world. But to be a communist does not mean, oh, we need a big communist revolution, communist party, especially not the one across the border here, no? Which will, no, to be a communist means for me just this, to admit that we are approaching a certain deadlock, that things cannot go on indefinitely the way they do, and that also we cannot find a solution by returning to any tradition. You know what people say, like, oh, capitalism is disintegrating social texture, so we need capitalism, but with some a ancient, Buddhist, whatever, uh, Confucian tradition. This is basically today's China, Chinese solution, which is why Confucianism and so on are fully supported by the state in China today. I think communism just means this opening. It's no longer the 20th century communism where you know the laws of history, what will happen. No, we have no guarantee that we will save ourselves. It's up to us. The situation is open. We just know that we are approaching difficult times, that it cannot go on the way it did, and it's up to us to act or not. There is no higher necessity directing us. You know that old-style communists like to say how, oh, the situation may seem dark, but there is always a light at the end of the tunnel. I'm coming from Eastern Europe. Our humor was always very cynical. So when somebody tells me there is a light at the end of the tunnel, my reaction is, of course it is, because it's another train <laughs> approaching us, you know. So uh, that's all I try to tell you. I don't have clear solutions. Communism is for me the name of a problem. Our problem today is the problem of commons, commons of our earth, commons of our, uh, uh, of our biogenetic legacy, commons of our intellectual substance, so-called intellectual property which shouldn't be privatized, and so on and so on. That's our problem and the situation is open and we have to start thinking radically. Which is why also places like here, universities, are, I claim, extremely important today. The establishment literally doesn't want us to think. I don't know how, maybe you are lucky here, but in Europe and United States, there is now a white movement saying, who needs this ivory tower of universities? Universities should serve concrete needs of people and so on. No, I think that what they want us, universities, is to produce experts. But we, if we are true intellectuals, we are not experts. Experts are people who do what? Experts are people who solve problems defined by others. For example, there are riots in Paris and police calls experts. How will we psychologically, how will we manipulate the demonstrators, what force should we use, and so on. To be a true intellectual is something much more. It's not just to solve problems defined by others, it's to define the problem itself. As a rule, the way we perceive a problem is part of the problem. We perceive the problem in the wrong way. The task of us intellectuals is to, not to offer solutions, who knows today, but to make people really aware of the problems that we are in. And for this, again, we need apparently useless institutions like universities. My God, all great inventions were never planned. They come as a, as they say in Iraq, collateral damage. And we should do a lot of collateral damage to the system by simply thinking freely. That's why you have all this pressure on, like, uh, like, my God, how can you spend time and money here just doing your theories while people are starving in Africa or whatever? 
This is brutal manipulation. Because the message is, do something, don't think. No. We should have the courage to say, yes, the situation can be desperate, but precisely in such situations, we should withdraw out of being fully part of life and think. We need the distance of universities today more than ever. I'm sorry if I was too long and I'm infinitely grateful for your patience. Thank you very much.